my name is April Atmansky, and you're listening to No Such Thing as a Bad Movie Podcast. I'm here today with Justin DeClue. And we're also here with Colin Cunningham. And we're all here to talk about bad movies, but not in the way that you would think. April, you're a bad movie aficionado. Would you put that label on yourself? Yes, I would. And that's because you like laughing at them, right? Feeling superior to them. Well, I kind of feel like, why even call them a bad movie? Because <laughs> I enjoy it so much, it's not even really a bad movie at that point. Yeah, like it's entertaining. <laughs> and Colin, what about you? Why are you interested in talking about the movies that we'll be doing here? I think it's just how fascinating they are and how unique they are. And it's just the thought process, I think, you know, when you see something really weird. You think like, God, what was going on behind the scenes when they were making this movie? Yeah, I think that like the individuality of the films is what always interests me, that they're these found objects that could only exist from the vision of like, most of the time, one creative person. Yeah, and I also feel like there's something to enjoy kind of in all of these movies, whether it's acting that's so bad, but it's really funny or set design that is so cheap. It's, it's It looks nothing like it's trying to achieve and it kind of transcends that level of, yes, it's bad, but it's so interesting to look at. It becomes funny and therefore it becomes enjoyable. When I got into watching movies, especially when I became a film critic on, I assume, like a MySpace journal of some kind, that like I always expected films to like fit within a framework of they have to do these things to be satisfying to me. And as I grow old and death comes closer with each day, <laughs> I realize that like, no, I I want things to be different. I want them to give me something that I haven't seen before. Yes. And these so-called bad movies are the things that are like the delivery mechanism for this like, wow, I couldn't even dream something up like this. Yeah. It's a lightning in a bottle. Yeah, exactly. When you do find them, they're they're like little gems. Exactly. You'll like have never have seen anything like it, and you probably never will again. Right. So for this podcast, the gimmick for this is we're going to watch two movies for each episode, and we're going to each talk about something that we liked about each movie. It could be multiple things if we're really inspired. It could be <laughs> us struggling to say anything about the movie that we watched. And the way that I would like to go through it until the people that are on these episodes kind of rebel and say, no, no more, is that we'll watch one kind of conventional bad movie in the sense that like people know it, you go to it for laughs, and then the second one will be like punishment. It'll be like, <laughs> what's the opposite of dessert? I guess you eat your meal, they're like, more vegetables. And you're like, no! <laughs> and these will be movies that would have that cover that'd be really appealing. And then you take it and put it into your VCR and realize, holy shit, this was shot in like the director's mom's basement. They often are shot in people's basements. And they're not the ones that people usually talk about that much because they're not conventionally Fun in the same way that something like The Room or the movie that we watched today, Jim Cotta. Uh, this was one that you picked, April, and why did you go for this one? Well, I don't think it's actually as well known as like a Troll 2 or something like that, but it's got like a bigger budget. It, it kind of has everything. It's got interesting fight scenes. It's got a gimmick, which is a guy who does gymnastics has to go fight a bunch of people and do karate and it becomes Jim Cotta and he has a whole mission. But it's got like interesting costumes, it's got interesting sets, it's kind of like a globe-trotting adventure. And by globe, you mean like Bulgarian <laughs> cities? <laughs> it's like two countries. I think it's in the United States. It's just States like back then... alleys somewhere <laughs> yeah. in Eastern Europe that they keep reusing like So again Colin, again. as the person here who's been on this earth the longest, were you aware of Jim Cotta when it came out? <laughs> Not when it came out, but I remember, I, I definitely knew of it and it was in my brain and I think it was just playing on city TV once when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I remember from the movie, other than the title, was uh, The Village of the Crazies. Yeah. Because that scene is nightmarish. It is, it is, yeah. It's really, and that really stuck with me. For people that don't know what the plot of the film is, it stars real-life Olympian Kurt Thomas, who acted in three films, Gymkata, a TV movie called Circus, and Slam, who plays 
an Olympian uh, gymnast who is given the mission to go save his father in a weird Bulgarian village. This is really weird. And it's like we were talking about it. They have they dump so much exposition on you in the beginning. It's just like right from the get go, the plot is being explained. Mm -hmm. And we're like halfway through this movie. And we're like, what the hell is going on? Like, what is the plot? It was too much exposition all at once. And you just kind of like zone out. So it's like, wait, what what country are they going to? They're going to a place called Parmesan. Mm-hmm. which I believe is a fake country. <laughs> um, it's, uh, no, it's no. an actual real country yeah. where they played the deadly game. Uh, yeah, that's where right. the delicious uh, Parmesan cheese comes from. <laughs> that's right. But everything is kind of dumped on you in the first 15 minutes. So it's like, we see him doing gymnastics and then a guy shows up and he says, you need to go to this country where your dad went and he played this deadly game where if you win the game, then you get whatever you want you win your life he says you win your life and you get one request from the ruler of this country and the request is that they want to install like a star wars style satellite this was an actual thing that in the reagan yeah reagan Reagan era era. it's like they were going to be able to like track you know enemy missiles in the the sky and shoot them out of the sky with lasers Mm -hmm. um so (laughs) parmistan apparently is the perfect location for this satellite but uh uh-oh they have to uh play the most most terrible game as the novel this movie's based on is called The Terrible, terrible. Game. Oh my god. Uh, and they have to win this thing, which hasn't been won in 900 years. Yeah, everyone who's got it, if a man enters the country, you must participate in the game. <laughs> and the thing is, as well, that Sexist. this game is basically like the shitty thing that your uh, coach would do when he didn't know like something to <laughs> yeah. set up in gym class. He's like, I don't know, climb some ropes and uh, there's like a rope bridge it's you have like to go the over. Worst obstacle course no, you've I ever done. Just shoot arrows at you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so our favorite Olympian decides to go to this country and he goes on a bunch of adventures. We're not going to spoil it because I want to go around and we can talk about like what we liked about this movie. So I'm going to go to April first. What did you like? Okay. Well, my probably my favorite thing was the fight choreography. Mm-hmm. It's not just the fight choreography. It's that like you know, our main character and, you know, everybody he ends up getting in a scuffle with, they all kind of clearly have, like, some kind of martial arts training. There is an extended sequence where people are just shooting them with guns, but there's a lot of fight scenes. And even though there are some, like, boring stretches, it keeps the action going. And so you just have a random, you know, the antagonist will start show up and he'll just be, like, whipping, like, knives around and he's doing, like, this, like, crazy kata with them. It's not only that, but it's filmed competently. So I've seen a lot of movies movies where you see this fight scene and you can't even tell like what they're doing like you can't even see what's happening and even though he'll be kicking someone and it's like a foot away from the guy's head but they throw in that punch sound effect or the kick sound effect and it's like I forgot to mention that this film was directed by Robert Klaus, the man who gave the world Enter the Dragon and right. uh, Jackie Chan's first uh, North American role, the Big Brawl, also known as Battle Creek Brawl. And he's notable because he's a director that was completely deaf. <laughs> and uh, as some like cinema dictionary entries I've read on him say, that's why his films are so visual. And I'm like, I don't know if that adds <laughs> up, but okay. <laughs> How about you, Colin? What was the thing that like attracted you the most? Uh, attracted to, you. To attracted me. It's an attractive movie. Well, it's just a, the, the visual the DVD cover. <laughs> See, oh, this amazing. has an amazing DVD cover. It's fantastic. It has an amazing tagline. What's the tagline? Yeah, it was like Jim Cotta. The, the skill. The, the skill of gymnastics with, with the, the kill, kill of karate. <laughs> yes. he, he fights with gymnastics, he and does wherever flips. he goes, there yeah. are conveniently uh, pommel horses. And, uh, uneven bars. Parallel, yeah, the uneven bars, <laughs> just here and there. And there was the one sequence where he finds the uneven bar and his hands are clearly chalked up. Like, mm-hmm. he just jammed his hands into a bag of chalk. What's your mm-hmm. favorite part of the movie? Uh, well, I gotta say, the Foley uh, is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, there is a, an extended foot chase. It's like they keep reusing the same sort of punches and kicks and they almost kind of reach like Lucas film levels. Like if you watch like Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, any of the Indiana Jones movies, they have like a particular set of like punches mm-hmm. uh, that are just so overdone. It's amazing. But it's most like, movies have like <laughs> the same foley they use over and over again. It's like slight variations. They'll have like three punches and the three kicks. Indiana Jones ones though, like the punches are just so like meaty and they have like a big, you know, and they always have like the kind of Lucasfilm uh, gunshots, which are like 
cannons almost uh, you know like but this movie is just filled with these punches and kicks which are just so amazing and there's an extended foot chase that goes on forever yeah not much gymnastics happening in this foot chase no. either it's just them running and in it's, like it's a just the shooting guns at them yeah. Yeah. they're like shooting guns, guns but it's like in between the gun shots it's just like all you hear is just like a footstep foley like and they just keep reusing the same alleyway over and over and over again and it just doesn't end it's yeah just, yeah it's all the movie. action scenes in this movie go on and on and on like once they start they're like we don't know when to stop and they just keep beating up whoever they are beating up at the time. probably the same five stuntmen over and over yeah. again like yeah. they're wearing ninja masks and stuff like that yeah. i think my favorite thing other than the uh fashion of the star like he <laughs> is like dedicated to wearing stuff like um, like a button-up shirt o- under a sweater, like a big red one for some reason. Well, he has the, yeah, it's like Knit red sweaters. with like uh, the American flag colors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or at one point he has like a black turtleneck the entire yeah. time. It's no wonder they know he's American. <laughs> uh, as a character says in the film where he's like, oh, he, they're just making fun of America. Oh! And he takes an arrow. Shot with an arrow. <laughs> this is a film filled with like people being killed randomly out of nowhere. My favorite part has to be the like nightmare city that they visit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Because, like, the game is set up in a way where you have to climb a rope, and then you have to go across a rope bridge, and then you go in a nightmare city? <laughs> like, that's the third step. The village of the... Cra- uh, the, the, old the, man, the old man refers to it as the village of the damned, I think, mm-hmm. uh, or town of the damned, and then later on it's, it's village the, the village of the crazies. <laughs> and I what? guess it's, like... Just all the crazy it's where people. they send all their mentally ill people. Yeah. Was there any scene that frightened you there, April? Yes. There's a guy who has, like, a mask on the back of his head <laughs> of a face. And I'm pretty sure in the reality of the movie, it's supposed to be a real face. Mm-hmm. Because why would they have rubber masks in a village of crazy people? And it's like an abandoned city and then people just come out of the woodwork and start attacking our hero it's really creepy or attacking themselves they like cut their hands off yeah yeah and there's like a guy yelling from a window and a guy not wearing pants and and, uh, (laughs) the scariest man of all (laughs) like at this point the hero sees like the backwards face man he sees a dude cut his hand off and then he sees a bare ass and he's like whoa Whoa, no homo he kicks them all (laughs) and then he eventually escapes and yeah but it's like justin you were saying this would be like a, the kind of worst kind of like Disney ride like you know you go to like Pirates of the like Caribbean the Mansion or something. Just be Village of the Crazies and <laughs> yeah. you go through and just like these animatronic arms kind of trying to grab you out of but then you look around in the corner and you see the Jim Cotta guy like doing the pub horse <laughs> and kicking people and stuff like that oh yeah so they set it up at the very beginning of the scene kind of like pan by the or pan over by this uh, this it's clearly a pommel horse it's, yeah. it's a well but then it check have, off's pommel horse yeah you gotta use it later yep. on and he does, and he just spins around, and he kicks a bunch of people, and and there's there's always that kind of cliche in kung fu movies where the crowd just sort of stands around as the guy takes them on mm. one by one. This literally is that, <laughs> or people just sort of shake their axes. He's doing whatever it's called when you flip around on a pommel horse, and he just kicks these old crazy people one Jim, by one. Jim Cotta, right? <laughs> That's what he's doing. Uh, what did you point out about the villagers? They're all like senior citizens, <laughs> and like it's not just the village of the crazy people. Everyone in Parmistan appears to be over sixty. <laughs> And there's also some really funny, like, extras in this movie. There's a lot of crowd scenes because Mm -hmm. this is, like, a big deal, the game, and all the townspeople come out and cheer for them. And there's people, like, just lacklusteringly just randomly waving their arms and looking in the wrong place. And then one guy gets run over by a horse (laughs) randomly, which I don't think was planned. looks like an accident. Yeah, they were running off to go start the race, and then a a random extra kind of (laughs) gets plowed down. Richard Norton (laughs) takes him out with with his horse. Yeah. We forgot to mention Richard Norton, a uh, martial arts superstar who uh, starred in, I say the word starred very lightly, uh, appeared in a bunch of Hong Kong films, including Sammo Hung's Shanghai Express, Any Fights Jackie Chan, and City Hunter. Ooh. He's the guy that doesn't turn into the Street Fighter character. That guy's played by Gary Daniels. And he's in a lot of Cynthia Ross Rock, like 90s action films. And the und- I believe he's in Undefeatable oh, with really? Cynthia Ross Rock. Who yeah. is he playing that? I don't know. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen that film, as I pointed out. Oh. Oh, oh, man, <laughs> my geek credentials as a movie guy is going to have to be taken away. It's good. April pointed out that, like, this doesn't really happen anymore, that, like, sports stars headline a movie in their sport. 
Like it's a gimmick that people don't really wrap their heads around other than something like Thailand Born to Fight, which came out in like the 2000s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but look at like Space Jam. Like that, <laughs> that was in the 90s. Yeah, that's true, but you don't see Space Jam now. No, no, you know? that's what I mean. I completely agree with you. <laughs> I think it was more of an 80s and 90s thing because they were looking for what was what's the next big thing. Sports stars are mm-hmm. really popular. You to transition them into, into movies or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, and now I just don't <laughs> think sports stars transitioning into actors is really a thing. Maybe because it kind of failed in the 80s and 90s. Who mm-hmm. knows? But Dennis, I don't think Kurt Thomas Dennis did that Rodman. bad of a job. Yeah, Dennis, Shaq and Steel. Oh, right. Dennis oh, Rodman. Shaq. What was he in? What about, uh, what about <laughs> Stone Cold with Brian Bosworth? Yeah, but like these wo- these movies, like they're not playing their sport. I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Like like in Jim, Jim Cotta, he specifically... Well, <laughs> he's doing gymnastics, but... Yeah. I like, wanted to say, though, he clearly had martial arts training. Like, you can't just do what he does in this movie and just be a gymnastic star. So I don't know if he was already like a black belt or well, what. he's already like trained and he's very nimble and I'm, flexible. I'm just saying, hey, I have a martial arts background myself. And, and Kurt Thomas, please send us a letter. Where, where uh, April would like now? to meet you. Where's Kurt Thomas? Is there an interview with him on this DVD you have? I don't nope, there's no special so. features. What? Kurt Thomas, give us a ring. We'd love to have a chat with you and just uh, through the rigors you went through on Jimkata, and we want to know how Robert Klu- Klaus directed. Klaus? Klaus? That's Man, right. Man, ah, the Justin mispronouncing <laughs> you, of names. How did you say he directed? You would, like, ask his assistant? His assistant, uh, his assistant director, oh, did they get the words right? And they'd be like, <laughs> yes. And then they'd move on. Well, we all know film is a visual medium, and that's, <laughs> well, that's like, all that a, matters. It's a part of it. It's a combination. <laughs> The score is pretty good. It's got a very catchy, uh, you know, (laughs) (laughs) but I compared it to the score to Predator, Alan Silvestri. Alan Silvestri. Because it's kind of like, it takes an action scene that is pretty good and it bumps it up with this like bombastic, like horn based score where you're like, whoa, like it's kind of- Yeah, man, Jinkata is the Predator. (laughs) It gets you you pumped up. And even though it's repetitive, it plays a lot. It's still like, oh man, can you imagine if it wasn't in the movie? Well, this is a film that while the martial arts are very energetic and stuff like that, the geography of what's going on is very confusing a lot of the time. Oh, it's like a so. dream. Like Kurt will just leave one room and then suddenly be in a palace and suddenly get into an action scene. It's, yeah, uh, like he, he and the the bad guy will kind of like meet eyes and then it'll kind of cut. He'll run out of the room and then it'll cut to him entering the room with the bad guy, which it's just like very strange. It's a little strange. confusing, but it's a minor, minor, minor issue. You know, it just makes it fresh, right? Like you don't know what's going to happen. He could run toward a guy and then suddenly he's in another room. Yeah. What is reality? <laughs> Which brings us to the second movie that we watched, which is Ooh, Jungle boy. Trap. This is a film that <laughs> came out in 1990. Oh, wait, no, it didn't come out in 1990 because what ended up happening was the filmmakers were not able to sell it, so it sat on a shelf till 2016 when the guys from Mondo Video and Bleeding Skull found the masters of the film in director John Bryan's barn, I believe, or his garage. And they went, what the hell is this? And the director, who had made films like Don't Go in the Woods, Lady Street, fighter went oh this is a movie we make called jungle trap that we couldn't sell so we never put it together we didn't do any music or sound effects and now we live in a time where anybody can do a whole movie by themselves so they said oh we'll fix this and they put out this movie jungle trap starring renee hartmond is that the lady with the red hair yes yes so she is a older lady maybe in her late 40s mm-hmm. and she is the main character of this movie even though it's kind of a Ensemble piece. Yeah, an ensemble piece, but... I think you're being generous with the age. I think she's she's, she's older than that. She might be in her early 50s, but she's got a very heavy accent of indeterminate origin. Eastern European. Yeah. Sometimes it sounds French, though. And sometimes it sounds kind of German. And this actress, Renee Harmon, is one of the undiscovered kind of cult figures because in her lifetime, she wrote and produced a bunch of films and starred in that were meant to kind of highlight her in her kind of like twilight years <laughs> and at the same time highlight the people that were featured in her acting class. You know who she okay. reminded me of? Who? Mrs. Roper. What? Who's that? We're from Three's Company. <laughs> we're, we're too oh, young man. to get that. Oh, man. Colin is showing his age. <laughs> I've never seen a full episode of Three's Company. Oh, Sorry, uh, Colin, did you notice that my baseball cap was turned sideways? <laughs> and I started this conversation with radical. <laughs> um, yeah, so Jungle Trap 
it's kind of that amazing movie as well where like why did it decide to make this kind of movie? Yeah, which is like weird. a jungle adventure ghost murder mystery. It's a haunted house movie, mm. essentially. It becomes that. They go on this expedition, mm. this group of museum, I guess they're like Indiana Joneses. <laughs> Just very old Indiana Joneses. <laughs> they're all old, except for their... Okay, so our main character, lovely redhead... Um, uh, Renee Harmon. Yeah, she, her and, and her, her husband. husband, who they're separated. He's got a hot young girlfriend, and they have a couple other people on their expedition, and they go to this tribe that they had been to previously that another colleague had died, and they think that the tribe is out to get them, essentially. Because they want to go to a hotel that was built there? I don't know. It's they, in the jungle. A hotel yeah. in, the jungle. in the jungle. And she, the guy says, what was the hotel called? And she says, a palace something. I can't remember. Palace Hotel. <laughs> That's yeah. what it was. Exactly that. And they come upon it in the jungle and it's just like a garage door with <laughs> Palace Hotel put on it. Yeah. Uh, I want to ta- start right from the get-go what I love the most about this movie. And it's just the ingenuity of going you know what, like we're gonna make a jungle film in some dude's house. You got some potted plants, we're just gonna put them in frame. And like the frame is like seven feet wide and no one can leave that frame because there's (laughs) nothing around it. But yeah, they ran out of like uh, plants and they even like credit the plant guy in the end credits. I think that was the gardener maybe. Was it? (laughs) Uh, Like the film is shot like a play, which is the camera kind of steps back you get to see everybody turn toward the camera. Yeah. yeah. And everything follows that like main wide frame. And you get some close-ups every now and then. But that's about as much variation as, as you're going to get. It seems like the last third of the movie is just that one shot. Of, Listen, of they them. only have so many plants. <laughs> Their plant budget. Yeah, but it's kind of amazing, like, the engineering, like you said. Like, they're clearly so limited with their budget, but, you know, they plan to do this big jungle adventure. And it's like, all right, well, They did what they could, you Mm -hmm. know. How about you, uh, April? Oh, man. It's got to be the editing, because we... Okay, so half this movie is like stock footage that they use to kind of fill out the movie. I don't, because this was an early assembly cut, right? Well, every film that James Bryant made has that like stock footage stuff. Oh, really? Stuff in okay. It, yeah. Well, it seemed like they were maybe gonna shoot it later, maybe not. So you'll see people in the jungle and they'll be like, what's that? And you cut to stock footage of like a snake on a branch. Or, you know, they'll arrive in a scene and then there'll be like stock footage of a random tribe cutting down trees and then you would hear the chainsaw in the background but not not even that there's ghosts in this movie <laughs> and they, no they just flash on and off the screen like they are like like it's like a jump cut they're just disappearing and so it's a jump cut you would do when you're making a film in like the seventh grade and you're like whoa yeah. we can yeah. make people appear and disappear yeah, they don't we can like stop fade. the camera and then they just ruined. they just pop away mm-hmm. yeah. and even though yeah it's kind of like an amateurish like move it made it interesting and the cuts were fast too Mm. So it's a short movie, but guess, they, they, yeah. they kept the pace up, and yeah. that was important. We should point out that the film was kind of re-edited by, um, I'm going to say his name wrong, Joseph A. Zimbwa, who's one of the Bleeding Skull guys. I know I got his yeah. last name wrong completely. <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, he kind of pieced it back together. So I feel it's probably maybe a little tighter than it would have been mm-hmm. yeah. if they had released it themselves. It gets but, really kind of artsy and weird. Yeah. Like, it was just like this one point where a green light just started flashing on screen <laughs> it and was it got like, all psychedelic. There and... were, yeah, it was like a psychedelic alien thing at one point, which we're probably making it sound a lot better than it is. But it, <laughs> well, I mean, it does turn into Assault on Precinct 13 in the last 10 minutes yeah. all of a sudden. Yes. My favorite part was the car chase at the beginning. (laughs) This is so weird. Like, speaking of stock footage, uh, so uh, the the couple at the beginning hire this sort of, like, you think it's going to be the lead character of the Mm -hmm. movie. This big, tall, like, strapping adventurer guy. John Holmes-looking fellow. Oh, yeah, for sure. Gigantic mustache. (laughs) Huge cock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Listen, this episode is (laughs) X-rated. No one can see I made an X with my hands. (laughs) So... Radical. <laughs> so um, it feels like I'm hanging with the young kids. <laughs> so he comes into the movie, and they're like, "All right, we're going to hire you to be our jungle guide and lead us to this tribe." I guess they want I don't know the treasure or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, "Okay, on board." And then he t- they just cut to him driving home, I guess, to his house. He is clearly he's in a car, and they don't even bother. <laughs> 
there's like a tree behind him in whatever parking lot they're shooting this in <laughs> and it is not moving at all and they're just sort of jostling the car around and he's driving like a kind of gray Volvo or a K car and they just start cutting like an it looks like an action scene from another it movie it was like a cop car yeah well, it was like it was like a big sort of like wagoneer or something yeah. mm-hmm. with two people in it <laughs> <laughs> and then another car was sort of ramming him they're sort of pretending that oh they're shooting in like ramming his car and it's like oh this whole like action scene looks like it's just cut from another movie mm-hmm. There's something like, again, it goes to the, like, they're not letting these limitations stop them. No. Like, oh, we're going to be in a plane, so it'll be, like, cardboard up. And oh, yeah. what looks like, like, you know, the things that you would, like, run with in an exercise, like the handles. It was, like, handlebars yeah. from an exercise bike. And, yeah. like, only the bike like, was out of frame. They kind of, like, just, yeah, they're covered in, like, and foam rubber. And that was the airplane set. Mm-hmm. The, the cockpit of the airplane. And we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the score by Annie Choi. And I have it in front of me, Joseph A. Ziemba. I can't, I'm not saying it right same, again. Same name. And they, they they get the score so perfect that you would just assume that it was made when the movie came out. Like they recorded it all on 80s instruments, and they had the perfect time where they hit that like. Da, da, <laughs> da. It was well edited too, so it was like cut to the action. Yeah. So like a scene would cut away and then the music would stop and it made it so much more watchable. And this is a uh, film that is not woke, considering the uh, tribesmen that appear, a bunch of white guys wearing masks. Walking around grandma's house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really, has like, some, like, like ferns in it. Not grandma's house, grandma's basement. Grandma's basement. <laughs> There's no yeah. windows that we know. It has like kind of thick shag rug like <laughs> yeah. carpet with this sort of snake that they have going around it. We were very impressed when at one point we realized that the snake was actually like in the footage that they shot. Yeah. It all made us like sit snake. up a little bit. We were like, ooh, whoa. They got, they got they snake had a money? snake handler too because you could see his you hand see in the corner of the frame. <laughs> Just pushing the snake in. You know it was like Joey, someone's snake, right? That they're like, oh man, I have a snake. Yeah. Just put it in there. That's production value. <laughs> I mean, this is something that I feel like we're going to come back to all the time that people are like, it's production value and it's like, nobody cares. Yeah. Like, no viewer watches a film and goes, oh wow, they got that? God, what, was the, what was the budget on this movie? <laughs> Exactly. During the Q and A, what camera did you shoot on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cameras. It looks like it was shot. There's multiple film stocks and video well, types. It's kind of unnerving because you go from film to video to video, but it's it all kind of comes together to digital yeah. video because it looks yeah. like they shot footage of themselves as tribesmen to kind of pad it out a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And speaking of production value, like I think the one prop that they bought and they wanted to use as much as they could was like a shrunken head. Oh, yeah. It looked pretty good and it was clearly like, okay, we have this really good prop, you guys. So we have to keep showing it. And and I think it came, I mean, it came back like five times. Renee Harmon <laughs> was not shocked when she saw the head. I don't think anybody was shocked. It, it sounded <laughs> Nobody like, was shocked at anything this whole movie. It, it shows up in her cupboard at the beginning of the movie <laughs> and she doesn't seem to care. Uh, they, they see a ghost at one point, and they're just like, oh, what's that? Oh, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, there's a little bit of shocks at the end, like our uh, favorite guy, Josh, who gets killed and screams. This is the most emotion he showed throughout the whole movie. It's so weird that, like, the film seems to believe that we'll care about them getting a divorce and going on with their lives. They spend a lot of screen time, like, talking <laughs> yeah. about their, their relationship. He's, he's hooking up with the young ingenue. Yeah, and Renee Harmon doesn't trust that young ingenue. She no. believes she's out to get them. Maybe she's right. No, jeez, you're gonna have to watch the movie Jungle Trap to find out, okay. which is actually only available if you go to the Mondo website, the um, place that sells all those posters that go off sale really quickly. Yeah, they sell out in five seconds. And they are $50. But this DVD is really cheap, so I would highly recommend for people to pick it up, because maybe it'll go out of print and we'll be able to see it. And this is one of those movies, like, people who like to watch movies like this and just enjoy them, enjoy them with their friends, they always want to be on the cutting edge and get that movie that, like, their friends don't know about. Yeah. Your friends don't know about Jungle Trap, yeah. so go and watch it, because it'll... I don't want to say blow their mind. Maybe melt it. Because <laughs> everybody sitting recording, when those last minutes were going on, we were like, what is happening? Yeah, It was incomprehensible. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, and Jim Cotta's on DVD, I guess. I get on them. Oh yeah. yeah, for sure, definitely. Jim Cotta is a great movie. I highly recommend it. I bought it on Amazon. That's a genuinely entertaining movie. <laughs> so, what do you hope this podcast to do, April? Like as the episodes roll on. Well, I hope that we are able to kind of recontextualize <laughs> some you know, quote unquote, bad movies out there because there's not really a new term for this kind of like so bad it's good genre and it's Mm. become like a genre and kind of like a cultural trend. There's plenty of people out there just like, oh, you know, just make fun of it because it's so bad. Mm -hmm. Even though we might do that a little bit, it's still kind of like... We we, we actually like these people. like Yeah, like, or even not necessarily like the people, but like the (laughs) movies themselves. Yeah, we don't like you, (laughs) Renee. Harmon, I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about the people that made it, but if you get any kind of enjoyment out of a movie like this, I think it's worth seeking out, maybe even worth your money. So mm-hmm. I would hope that we can kind of spread the word about some of these movies and get people to watch them. It's tough. But you don't want to just do another podcast where you're like, oh man, it's bad. And it's impossible, like April said, not to talk about that a little bit where you're like pointing things out. But then our goal will always be like, but I like this about it. Like this is crazy and good Mm -hmm. and entertaining. And that's why you should watch this movie. Not because like the editing is wrong or something like that. (laughs) But even if something is bad, Mm -hmm. that does make it good. It's it's, it's, it's confusing. It's enjoyable and it's worthwhile and you can take something from it after watching it and yeah uh, for whatever reason Mm -hmm. i would watch any of these movies again basically yeah i'd watch jungle trap again Mm. absolutely (laughs) i've already seen jim cotto like many many times times. (laughs) amazing it just puts you to sleep every night you're like (laughs) (laughs) when you were a kid you would like watch jim cotto and you're like i'm gonna do these moves you're like learning them i'm I'm kurt thomas Thomas. (laughs) all right well that brings our first episode to a close if you want to tweet at me you can find me at at April at Mansky. That's oh. my Twitter handle. Colin, do you have a Twitter handle? <laughs> oh yeah, my Twitter handle. Or, or an Instagram. Uh, I I MySpace. Do a blank there. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, and I think it's at Sergeant Zima, S-G-T-Z-I-M-A, mm. I think. I don't know. It's your Twitter, dude. God, I hope so. Uh, my Twitter is DeClue, J D E C L O U X, and then just the letter J. We're going to be back soon with who knows what movie, something fun and something punishing. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye-bye.